would call me the walking newspaper. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I think it's kind of ironic that now this is what I work in, it's in the Montana Standard. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I grew up in, uh, behind St. Mary's, so we used to call it the North Side. I guess it's part of Cork Town. Um, but uh, had a lot of uh, older people. These are my two sisters, Kim and Lori. <laughs> so we grew up with a lot of older people in our neighborhood. And we spent a lot of time with them. And so I would make a habit of listening to their stories. And most of the stories were about Butte. So early on when, uh, you know, my mom and dad really kind of pressed, uh, they had a real passion for history and that kind of um, helped me along. Um, I really uh, have researched a lot on, on Butte history. Um, weather, you know, weird weather, earthquakes, um, uh, fires, uh, you, you know, and murders. And, you know, like it or not, and I, and I don't want to insult anybody, or, but some of them are pretty funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyway, the, the, one of the first murders I looked up was this, uh, he was the editor of the Butte Intermountain. And I don't know if any of you guys remember the Butte Intermountain, but it was right across from the Standard on Granite. But it was that very narrow building, part of the Silver Bowl block. And I think that went up in flames in 79. But anyway, he was the editor of that newspaper. And this was in, um, this was kind of, uh, was kind of racy it, for the time anyway. He was living with this woman. This woman had, her name was Madame Ruth Labonta. So anyway, he had gone to this newspaper gathering and then he was headed down to the train station. He was going to go visit his brother in Anaconda. Well, he missed the train. So he comes home to their apartment and lo and behold, she is in bed with the local physician. <laughs> and his name was Dr. Cayley. And anyway, she, uh, uh, he shot her. And the, the doctor lingered for 12 days. And in the meantime, the Levanta woman, she took off for San Francisco. And uh, <laughs> Kelly was in jail. And uh, Kaylee lingered for like 12 days. He told them who the shooter was. Kelly admitted that, yeah, he was the shooter. And uh, anyway, he did die. And so uh, anyway, they had this, they, they brought this Madame Levanta back. She was arrested, as was Kelly. And I haven't been able to confirm this, but Kelly was uh, with, with an EY. But his, um, and his lawyer was Con Kelly. And I've never been able to confirm if that was Con Kelly from the Kelly Mansion, because he was a lawyer as well. But anyway, the, and the, the newspaper articles, I mean, they had these, these elaborate drawings they made out that, you know, this woman was really, um, you know, they really painted her with, you know, bad. But uh, um, there was a trial, and the trial lasted for 10 days. But Kelly was acquitted. Oh. Yeah, ah. Kelly was acquitted. He admitted he was the shooter, but he was acquitted. Yeah. And Levanta, she was released. But this is what they, in, in the Anaconda Standard, um, this is what they reported. Levanta had enfolded Dr. Cayley in her infamous serpentine coils. <laughs> and Kelly, too, was viewed as a victim of a woman with no morals. So, yeah, so basically, he got away with murder. So, so and sometimes, you know, and, and, the, and it's not the first time, uh, th there was a case that was Thomas Pooley. He owned a, um, he was a saloon keeper. And it was right around where the courthouse is now, where it happened. But he literally got away with not just one murder, but he got away with two. And it, in 1900, he shot and killed his daughter and son-in-law. And the daughter was holding their baby at the time. Not sure, baby. But he shot and killed the daughter and son-in-law. And... Uh, he received a 99-year sentence, um, but he got a good lawyer, so uh, he was granted a new trial. And this is where, you know, 
this is where it gets really weird. Uh, somehow the testimony, the evidence, had um, it was blown out the window of the courthouse, and a hungry dog chewed them into a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My so dog ate my of homework. Lack of evidence, the second trial brought a hung jury, and Cooley was free. So again, he got away with murder. And um, he died in 1910. Those murders occurred in 1900. And this, when they uh, reported on his death, it just said he lived quietly in the city after having his case dismissed. So, yeah. So, do they know why he killed them? Or tried to know? And, you know, there's the, the thing is, is um, in, in the article, that they they said it was a, a family dispute, you know, and uh, that seemed to be a lot of, of that, and, and we'll, we'll kind of go into that. Do they have any record of what happened to the child? Do you know, that's a good question, no? Mm -hmm. You know, and, they, and there's, you know, as far as I know, and I'm sure um, someone in the family, but, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know that. Good question. But anyway, so in, uh, there's another case in 1893. So it's kind of like it's Butte's own version of Where's Waldo. So this guy, <laughs> Charles Busey, he lives in Washington. He comes to Butte looking for his estranged wife. Well, he goes to this um, boarding house on Mercury Street. Huh. Well, his wife is living with this um, actor named Waldo Whipple. <laughs> so, the name is just too funny. So, um, so Whipple, uh, he, fatally, uh, he was fatally shot by Busey. And uh, the woman was wounded. And Busey then turned the gun on himself. Um, but the, art, the paper described the wife, um, the woman, as the faithless wife and her lover. So that's, I mean, and they went into great detail about, you know, her. Um, her morals, you know, and whatnot. So, anyway, that was that, and that happened in 1893. So there was another one in 1922, and it was um, this Axel Holmquist. He was living in uh, in Alaska. His wife had divorced him, and six months prior, she moved to Butte, and she married his brother, Fred. <laughs> so anyway, what? What's really bizarre about this one is, is, is how they talked about, after, you know, and how the, the, the murderer was seen as just this, you know, really, really bad, bad person. But pretty soon, he had everybody's sympathy. And, and so anyway, what happened is he, uh, he came to Butte, and he shot and killed the brother, Fred, shot his three-year-old son. Oh, and killed him and shot the wife. And so anyway, but according to newspaper accounts, Holmes was crazed with jealousy and infuriated by months of melancholy brooding. And the murders were described as the climax of a sordid story, the telling of which seems like the unclean fiction of a diseased brain. I mean, they really, yeah. So, and but when the trial began, um, Holmquist was viewed as the devil incarnate, but as it progressed, mm -hmm. and here's where, you know, he had no contact with, with the brother and his ex-wife, but he claimed that they were, um, that uh, they kept throwing their, their, their relationship in his face, and, it, you know, and that's why it culminated, and I thought, well, you were living in Alaska, yeah. you know, so it's a little hard to throw the relationship in your face. If you're, you know, you're, you know, you're thousands of miles away, but anyway, uh, he was acquitted. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he was acquitted by reasons of insanity and was described as a man whose crime at the time of commission filled the public with indignation, which later turned to sympathy when it was shown on a reputable testimony that the man was an epileptic that he had been cruelly wronged and then mocked by his brother and ex-wife when they're living here and he's living there. And until an intellect already weakened by brooding and disease, um, he um, killed them. So, I mean, that's what uh, 
that was their excuse, and so he was acquitted. Um, he didn't. He died 18 months later. He was buried in a pauper's grave. Mm. But um, anyway, that it's another one where you know he literally got away with murder. So there is another guy, and this was in um, 1894. And I, if if you know anything about the, there was a um, riot um, in. Fourth of July in 1895. Um, believe it or not, the Irish weren't too welcome here um, when they got here. And so in 1894, here comes this Jerry Connell, and they're walking uptown. Um, and they were headed home, um, and it was Independence Day, 1894. But anyway, uh, Connell was uh, slightly inebriated, and he was loudly singing Irish tunes. <laughs> Someone yelled to him to shut up, and uh, he kept singing, and Shot <laughs> they never found who killed him. But, you know, I mean, that's, you know, God love them. So, yeah, singing, yeah, singing, yeah, yeah, your singing killed him. So, um, anyway, there was another guy, um, and uh, apparently you don't question someone's dancing skills either. Uh, this guy's name was John Caterno, and it was in 1914, and he was at a dance in Meterville. Well, some countrymen were teasing him that uh, this uh, Savarino Calvetti was a better dancer than he was. Well, he got ticked. He, he shot and killed him. <laughs> and, but what happened is a stray bullet hit um, uh, Calvetti's 10-year-old son and also killed him. So, but Caterno was captured and in days following the murders, he really, they said, this, these are newspaper accounts. He uh, really wasn't showing any remorse. And a uh, newspaper reporter wrote that Caterno continues to eat and sleep as one carefree. When it came time for dinner yesterday, he was first in line to get his helping of bread, beef, coffee, and potatoes. So anyway, he. Uh, but what, what I was telling Kim about this is what what's really weird is when he was captured, and I don't know where he, he was captured in Walkerville. Um, and when he, but him and the detective that, that uh, arrested him, they posed for a picture with the standard photographer. <laughs> so it's just kind of funny. Here's this guy, and then when they're when they're in they're in the um, some sort of room in, in the courthouse, and again, you know, they're all sitting around like they were having a commissioners meeting, and they're posing for the photographer. You know, so it the, you know it's just kind of. There was another one where in, in Meterville, and uh, this was in 1925, and it was Tony Pateri. And all I can get from this is it was some sort of dispute among these, these four Italian men. But um, on November 24th, 1925, he killed um, three men, and all in the same night, uh, two of them as they were coming out of um, uh, the, uh, of a house, Joseph Cicerelli and Antonio Favero, and then this John Dariana, who had eight children. Eight children. Um, between the three men, they were all married, there were 18 children. And so, anyway, but within the next 10 months, the Terry, he was, he was caught, he was tried, he was convicted, and then he was executed on October 1st, 1926. So, anyway, when, uh, and it is the last execution in Butte. It's the last execution in Butte. Um, but on the day of the execution, uh, he attacked police with metal pipes, um, and he did not go easily to the gallows, and they had to use tear gas on him. Um, but it is the last one to take place. Um, there's another guy, and I thought, um, uh, Daniel Lucy, and he was another one who, Hung. But he was in love with this woman, named, uh, Margaret Gallagher, and uh, he wanted money to marry her. Well, he didn't have it. He was friendly. So he killed him. Okay. Yeah, and his name was uh, Patrick Reagan. And uh, he's buried down at um, St. Pat's Cemetery. And not too far away is Daniel Lucy. Huh. He's yeah. also buried there. Um, Anyway, he uh, the it's it, the newspaper article um, said that uh, Lucy will sleep in the Catholic cemetery, but a little way 
from where the body of his victim is mingling with the mold. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? <laughs> and, and that's what I mean about some of this stuff being just, you know, you can't help it. You know, I mean, I did a story on cemeteries and I was out at the Holy Cross Center. And it's, there's, it, there's no one to go. I'm the only one out there. And I'm walking around looking at the headstones. And I turn around and look at this headstone and I just bust out laughing. The poor guy's name was Baldo Kaput. <laughs> But anyway, Daniel Lucy, um, he had family, and so that you know, a lot of these, uh, there were ten men that were executed by hanging here, and uh, uh, most of them went into a pauper's grave. But Daniel Lucy had family, which I thought was weird because he killed his friend for money, and but his family had money to bury him, you know. So um, anyway, but he uh, and that happened in. Um, September of 1900, but when he was executed, um, there were 2,300 people there to watch him. And it, there was a, there was a there was a hanging in 1918. It was three men, and um, I have an my my grandfather um, Michael Egan got an invitation. They sent out invitations to um, hangings. Yeah, so, yeah, and so anyway, but... Don't they do that now? You know, I, I don't know. I haven't been invited. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just seems so weird. And it was this nice little... Yeah, yeah it's just a nice card. I've seen one... Ju um, uh, I've seen some online for, for this, the 1918 execution. But, I mean, it just seemed weird, you know. And it, it's very nice, the calligraphy is, I mean, it's just nice. You know, but you think you were being invited to a wedding reception, you know, is, is how it looked. So, anyway. Um, but some of these things, I mean, there, there, there are some interesting cases. In 1944, um, a man living in the McQueen edition, he killed his wife with an axe. But he told police he did it so she wouldn't suffer anymore. And that's he basically it was a mercy killing. And I was like, wow. <laughs> not, not nice. <laughs> yeah. So, and in 1930, there was a guy, 18 years old. And this is how quickly things, you know, I mean, we all know how uh, murder cases are now. I mean, you know, one, you know, from being charged to, you know, being tried. You know, it, it can be upwards to a year, a year and a half before trial ever starts. Anyway, this kid was 18. He killed um, a businesswoman, um, Christina Wilson. She owned a lot of property in Butte. And apparently around the state as well. She was 62 years old. And it apparently was a robbery. But it was also described as the most brutal uh, murder in Butte's crime annals. Mm -hmm. And uh, but robbery was the was the motive. But what was interesting about this is the murder occurred March 12th. He took off for Texas. Uh, they they caught up with him in Texas. He was arrested, extradited to Butte, tried and convicted, and was in prison serving a, lar a life sentence by March 29th. That was 17 days. Yeah. I mean uh, that's just that's just not heard of anyone. You know. Um, you know, especially with, you know, so much work now with, you know, preliminary here and psychiatric evaluations, you know, DNA, you know. Um, there was a, a, another case in 56 where, um, really it was just no mess, no fuss, where, you know, the, these two men uh, had been feuding over a county road. Um, it was uh, James A. Daniel Boone. He claimed to be a descendant of Daniel Boone. He was 78. He shot and killed this 44-year-old Carl Graff, but um, he had to walk three miles to get to a phone. He called his son and said, you better get a trooper out here. And he turned himself in. You know, so, yeah, there was nothing to, and get this, he was a one-time candidate for sheriff. <laughs> yeah, but he calmly surrendered. He said, yeah, I did it, I did it. Yeah, but when you, um, 
Ellen let me go through, I went through all <coughs> the, the uh, death certificates, and, you know, one part is there's, there were a lot of babies found dead. A lot. A lot. A lot found in vaults, um, mine shafts, um, you know, it, it was surprising how many, how many um, there were. But there was also some that you just went, you got to be kidding me. You know, where did they... Uh, there was a guard at the Montana State Prison. He was found dead, um, you know, Nisler Junction. He had five bullet wounds to the head. It was uh, declared a suicide. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was declared a su uh, suicide. There was another guy who the, the ex-wife was looking for, and she put it out in the paper. She wanted. Um, this guy, dead or alive, you know. Well, lo and behold, and it was up near um, uh, a little past the East Ridge, uh, they found him. Uh, like, up near Boy Scout Lake, they found him. And, uh, and she had placed this ad several days before. But anyway, he was found dead with a bullet wound to the head. But oddly enough, there was no gun. Uh, it was a suicide. Oh, yeah. So I mean, you, you, you really did kind of, you, you kind of wondered about this, and so then I told one of the guys at work, um, I said, uh, "There's three out of the, um, well, let's just say 75 percent of the murders um, were uh, the victims were men." And I said to one of my coworkers, "I said, well, that, that seems fair, don't you think?" <laughs> <laughs> And there were a lot of murders that happened before 1894, and again, you know, it's kind of like the mining accidents. Once the company owned the paper, you know, you may find that there were three men that were killed in the mine, and you find it on page nine. You know, something that would be front page news now, um, the company owned the paper, so you would, you know, you may not. But in the early days, they didn't report murders as much. And so there's um, there's this one thing that they show on um, the year end. And so I went through those and went through some um, other documents where they said that they believed that the first murder occurred to a Chinese man who uh, they deliberately hung for fun. Um, that, that they say was, was the first murder in, in Butte. But, but anyway, they're, they're kind of sparse before 1894. So I, I did go through from 1894 on up. So in my research, I figured there's about 575 murders that have occurred since 1894. But here's what's weird, is most of those murders happened before 1930. Mm -hmm. a, a good part. From 1894 to 1929, so in a 35 year span, there's 390 murders. Wow. Um, in the past 85 years, less than half of those, about 185. So, and again, approximately three out of the four victims were male. I, I don't mean to insult, just, so, just, just saying. But, and then there were 10 legal hangings. Um, and in, the, in terms of victims, the biggest murder case was December 31st, 1949, January 1st, 1950. Um, apparently, uh, a, she was a student at Western. They came home for uh, uh, Christmas break. She supposedly killed her three siblings and her mother, and then killed herself. And the police don't have any of the evidence anymore. It's gone. Um, we, we, I've checked with her. The only thing that this one, and, and this is just speculation on my part, I'm not so sure she did it. I'm really not so sure she did it. Um, first off, it's it's you know it's not unheard of, but it's very rare that a woman kills that many people. Um, second of all, she shot herself, but she had a rifle. But when her body was found, it was like laying, like here's the bed, and you would think maybe she would have shot herself, like with the rifle going here, and she just slumped over or slumped back, but she was laying across the bed. And I thought, 
And I even took it over uh, to uh, Sheriff John Walsh and showed him the stuff. And he said, yeah, that does sound weird. But we'll never know if she did, if she did it or not because the, they don't have any anything on it anymore. You know, so what? That's 65 years ago, so they don't have anything anymore. So anyway, but any questions? I don't want to talk to you. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember when I was a kid, there was a murder of a mother and a daughter. The McQuistons. The McQuiston. I don't remember the name. It yeah, the, it was a mother and daughter, the McQuistons, and it remains unsolved. Huh. And I want to say, Fort Harrington, like 65, 66. Yeah. Fort Harrington will come in every now and then when he has some free time and just poke and around. And just look at, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. he said, he said, oh, you know, it's just always in the back of my mind. I just kind of come in and see well, if there's anything there's new. There's always rumors, you know, of who did it. You know, my mom. You know, remember my mom sharing with us who she had heard who did it. You know, but they've never. You know, um, they've never found who did it. But yeah, it was, that was a... It was but, gruesome. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I think, uh, I want to say there's a sister still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, so, actually, I think, you know, it's about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. when, when it happened. Was it a gun? Or, when I say gruesome, what? They were stabbed to death and wrapped up in rugs that they cut out of the floor and, and oh, fed dumped. the pigs. No, that was a different one. They were found up. <laughs> that was, they were found up behind dam. The yeah. Oh. They, the, the home was a mess. I mean, they knew right away something bad had happened. And I think the home was up in Cinnabon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And so she, but the, mm. I mean, there was a parent, you know. And the mother was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And she, the daughter, had just divorced. So I guess I was thinking of the other one. But that they discovered, the market, really. they identified them by their teeth mm -hmm. as like bodies had been fed to pigs. Is that true? Oh. Yeah. You know what? I've never heard that one. <laughs> yeah, it's McGuff from Walker. Well, they, but, oh, McGuff Neary? Yeah. Yeah. And they found her. Uh, like around that railroad track up in Roosevelt Drive. Because for a long time, for a long time, you know, there there were some in the, where the bodies were left out there. And there was a couple of girls in the 80s that the bodies were left out This was right Yeah, she, uh, uh, I want to say 68, the but they knew right away, or they, they knew who they were. Right, his name was they, they knew who had done it. I'm just going to ask. Yeah, he does. And, and um, I can't scooch. You know, there were quite a few in the 60s. But the questions, they remain. Um, um, unsolved. But the Neary girl was, there was a conviction on that. Yeah, so. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tracy, I'm wondering, you said there were 10 legal names. Yeah. Right? Um, other than, of course, the famous lynching. Uh, were there lynchings? Did, did you find illegal hangings as well? People took this to their own hands on, on murder? No, there was one where they almost did, at least from 1894 on, no. But there was, an, um, there was a gentleman, and it was... I can't think of their name. But anyway, uh, residents stormed the jail. Mm -hmm. And they tried, to, they, 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 um, they weren't successful, but they did try to lynch a guy. And there was another gentleman that they tried to lynch. There was um, a little girl that was murdered, six years old. Mm -hmm. And they weren't sure if, um, they were sure it was this, this older guy that had done it. I think her name was Eveline Blewett. Um, but um, it, it, he was, I, the guy that, um, uh, the two Irish guys, they moved him to the Data Lodge jail just because they were afraid that um, 
the next time they'd be successful. You know, so I mean, there's a John. Yeah. Two of them, really. Um, first question, what in the world possessed you to dig out all these murders? I mean, why did you decide to <laughs> you, you do a lot of this stuff on your honor stuff? It's just, this is kind of, I don't know, out of your realm of a little picture of but, history. You know what, though? I know, but you know, you read some of this stuff, and it's, I mean, it, there was a, um, you know the explosion in, in 1895? where all the firemen were killed. And I mean, I just loved how the paper, I mean, there's no way we could write like this. And, but I just loved how they, they and, and you know that this did not happen. But they were talking about this woman and there was an account in the paper where, anyway, and the woman was walking near where uh, St. Joseph's is. And anyway, the reporter said that when the explosion occurred, as she was walking, this head landed in her arms and gasped its last dying breath. <laughs> 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 and like, I mean, you know, and I'm sorry, that's funny. I mean, <laughs> and, and you know that that did not come out to it. But, you know, you, it, it was just the way they wrote. And so I told my boss, I said, I thought, um, when, uh, you know, 25 years ago when I started doing this research, I had, I had my regular job at the paper. But, you know, you, you find a rhythm of doing things, and pretty soon I had time on my hands. And this is what I did. So, I mean, I did, I mean, you know, we've got, I, I researched all the headlines from 1900 up. Um, you know, I researched all, again, all the, all the fires, you know, the murders. Um, I even researched, like, names, because I don't know if you guys have noticed some of the birth, some of the names in the birth announcements, that we get, they're a little odd, you know, they're, they're a little odd, and I, so it made me think, did, did they have odd names back then? Mm -hmm. So I went and looked, and you know what, they did. <laughs> <laughs> and some poor little girl name was Dimple Fern. I thought, oh, well, that's not nice. <laughs> Dimple Fern. But yeah, there was a lot of different names back then. So yeah, so it's just stuff like that. I got bored. And, uh, and these guys, Carmen, and then they, they just put up with me. And, and there she goes. Yes, Well, one of the things I want to say about, about Tracy with, with this is not just the murders, it's the way it was written, it's the history of everything and how it was projected. And so um, this is just a, a brief glimpse into what Tracy knows as to all the things that have been written in history and how they were reported. And I think that's the important thing. How they were reported. How well, did that she the are so sensationalized? Well, yeah, and we could. Everybody's interested in the murder. Well, but even, you know, and, that's so what, and I, I didn't kind of talk about that, but really, when you think about it, you know, um, my favorite actress is Margaret Rutherford. And I don't know if any of you guys know who she is, but <laughs> she played Miss Marple. Oh, oh. And um, she died, uh, I think, not long after I was born. But I mean, she was a riot. And but it, it was all, you know, murder stories. I mean, like it or not, that's you know, we find it entertaining. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, or otherwise, you know, my mom watched murder. She wrote, you know, all the time. You know, I, I was telling my boss though that I had a great aunt. Um, she would send me down to the Pino Newsstand when I was a young teenager to buy True Detective magazine. <laughs> and I mean, I felt like I was buying porn. <laughs> so I would, I would say, I would tell anybody who was standing there, anybody who cared, I followed everybody in making a point that, hey, you know, just so you know, this is not for me. <laughs> I'm not buying this for myself. <laughs> well, I bet you read them, Tracy. Huh? I bet you read them all. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I was like, huh. You know, and, and the star, you know, for some reason, that the just, choir. yeah, but, you know, those things, and, and my mom said, her mom read True Detective magazines, and, you know, so I thought, oh my God, it's in our genes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, really, you know, like the O.J. Simpson trial, everybody, when, when that verdict came in, we were all watching to find out what the verdict was. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, the, the trials, I, I was thinking back, like, um, 
you guys remember the movie that the girl in the is it the red velvet swing? It, it, it was a big murder case, and there was a case in the twenties, Leopold and Low. Oh, Low. Yeah. I mean that was it, and I mean that was front page news for many many days. Um, and you know, people were fascinated by that. You know, I think it remains one of one of the biggest cases in, in the in, for the 20th century. You know, so anyway, that's what got me. You know, Butte fascinates me. Um, you know, it, it just I, I, when 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 it came out that Rob O'Neill May was probably the shooter. You know, and I thought, you know, it's not really surprising. That so <laughs> you know, I, I and I thought about it. You know, we. Um, there were something like um, seven Butte men in the Baton Death March. Seven Butte men. You know, there were um, 11 people aboard the Lusitania from Butte. And get this, they lived across the street from my mom and dad. You know, so, so I mean, it was, you know, the, the same, almost the same number were on the Titanic. You know, so big things that have world, you know, Butte seems to be right in the thick of it. You know, so I think that's, it's just kind of interesting. So anyway, but. Uh, Tracy, you said 25% of the cases, the women were um, victims. What, how many women committed the murders? Oh, well, you know, that, that's a good question, but let me tell you. Don't be my Jean. You did, <laughs> Dirty Mouth Jean and, um, Ruby Garrett both killed their common law husbands uh, like within a week a week of each other, two weeks, in, in 1959. Um, Dirty Jean went to prison in the 80s for a shooting. But she did not, they really didn't, uh, uh, they basically got away with it in 59. And my research is no woman went to prison for shooting her husband. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, they didn't. I mean, it just, you know, they, again, they, they got away with it, you know, so, yeah. I was surprised you didn't talk about the Julianne Stallman murder. You know, because it's still an ongoing investigation. I know, but, um, and, and, and it, 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 it remains. Who did it, but he was a, a narc. But you know, I can't. You know, we can't go by, by you know, rumor. You know, I mean, it's and I mean, he got so away with that one murder where he ran into the man down on Harrison Avenue. Well, the thing is, though, is and, and that's why I really I did I focused on early day or you know, um, just because I really can't talk about it yeah. because I, I don't really know anything. You know. Um, well, my latest report on that was um, a retired um, state marshal who had run for um, sheriff at one time in Butte, and the report from him was that Hollingsworth said, but see, I can't even say, I can't, I can't, you know, we can't talk about it. It's, it's, it's still, that nobody's been charged, so, you know, but anyway. Did you have any colorful coroner stories? Well, you know what, I think the guy with the five bullet wounds, it's in the head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, I thought, suicide. I thought, yeah, that's what the part of Or even the guy, you know, with, with the, uh, and no gun in sight, you know. And, the, and they had an ad in the paper. You know, she had an ad in the paper. She wanted her husband to get her alive. Well, she got him. He did. You know, but, but no gun. You know, so... Oh, there's certainly, there's, and, and, and you look at some, and, and, and even when you look through those, and you should, look through some of those death certificates, and you're like, yeah. you know, these, these are two that, you know, really stand out, but there's others that I kind of went, huh, you know, but, uh, but these are the ones I want to focus on, just, be, I mean, you know, there, there really are, there's, there's lots of stories, there's, you know, there was a guy, 
who uh, was shot and killed for wearing an Irish uniform. Mm. I mean, so, um, you know, the, those, you know, those things happened, uh, you know, and uh, um, if you remember Lewis Duncan, the socialist mayor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, the, the things that happened, and that was, I think, in 1914. But really, the, and, and that, I think that was the big thing. In, the, in, in 1910s, there were 130 murders. Yeah, 130 murders happened in the 1910s. So I don't know if it was because, you know, I mean, you know, if, if things dwindled, you know, of course the population has, has dwindled. But, um, you know, and the red light district is gone, you know, um, you know, that's a... But the ethnic struggles uh, aren't, aren't there. You know, if you, if, if you ever get a chance, there's Father Brosnan, he wrote a, he wrote uh, letters home to his mom, and the archives has them. It gives a real good view of what he was like. And Father Brosnan, he was 26 when he died. He was the priest at St. Mary's. But during the Spanish flu epidemic, he, um, the, where Irene Scheidecker lives now, is, it was, um, it was a family, Mueller's, that, uh, um, there was a family, O'Meara's that lived there. He was the manager of the um, Pew Brewery. And he died. His wife died. Um, two of his kids died. His bosses died. The nurse that took care of them and the priest that gave them the last rites, they all died in the Spanish flu epidemic. So, I mean, anyway, he wrote these letters, and it really gives you a great sense of what he was like in, in, in that era. You know, it just just from his letters home. You know, so if you ever get a chance, try to read those because they're kind of fun. But I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.